Good evening, and welcome to Restored Lore, your home for old, odd, and obscure stories. Tonight's story is The Oxford Ghost by James Hain Friswell. This story comes from Friswell's Ghost Stories and Phantom Fancies, published in 1858. This is a peculiar story of a kind of cursed Christmas dinner, perfect for the long, strange nights of November. Now, let's open our imaginations and begin. Boodle, sing a song. I addressed the obese individual of that name, the capital B, as he delighted to be called, in the midst of a festive party. I always make a point thereat of asking the wrong man to do the right thing. It gives such a blaze of triumph to the capable if you show up the incapable. It makes the giant look taller, the strong man stronger. I ask the clown to dance, the dull man to make a joke, the fellow who should only be trusted with a spoon to carve a chicken. Boodle could no more sing than a crow. Sing a song, he answered with the voice of a trombone. I would as soon swallow a poker. I'm not a bashful man, but I am past singing, if ever I indeed was fit for it, and I do not much think that I ever was. I never sang in my life, but I felt ashamed of myself for doing so. Some people tune away, vociferating pleasantly, watching the flies on the ceiling, with an air about them which tells anyone how cleverly they think they do it. They like it, I suppose, but as for myself, I never in all my life sang, but I felt uneasy for at least three weeks afterwards. The last time I attempted anything of the sort was when I went to a white bait dinner, and do you know that I could not look at any of my friends in the face for three weeks afterwards? Pleasant that, was it not? Sing? No, I'll die the death of a martyr first. Then you will do something to amuse the party. A Christmas party comes but once a year. It is sacred to old feelings, old superstitions, old stories, old songs, old love, old fancies, and old remembrances. Thank heaven for Christmas. Amen, said the priest piously. You have been said the soldier of the party, carefully caressing his whiskers. You have been out in the world a good deal, sir? Oh, yes, answered my uncle. Out a good deal. Out of my reckoning sometimes, out of spirits very often, out of sorts as well. Very seldom till I grew rather wiser, out of debt, and, when I was young, I must confess it, what with dancing at parties with pretty girls and staying late at bachelors' rooms, very often out of nights. In these nocturnal rambles, did you ever see a ghost? Well, answered my uncle. I can't say that I did, and I can't say that I did not. I'm in a state of perplexity between the two. To my dying day, there is a point which I can never solve, and I don't believe I ever shall, either. No, not if I live to be eighty. It was about Christmas time, too. How was it, then? Why, thus... I was, in my younger days, a bagman. Why they called us bagmen, I don't know, nor do I care. Your aunt did. She used to be preciously wild about it. But so long as I pleased my customers and got orders for the house of which I am now the head, what cared I? I dare say the young fellows who look to inherit my sovereigns will not think them less heavy because they were earned by a bagman. I'd rather be called a bagman than a commercial gent. Commercials, they call them, now that they're whisked about from place to place in railway carriages. Ha! <laughs> Mine were the days. When I traveled, I did the thing like a gentleman. With my black-bodied gig and yellow wheels, a fast-trotting mare, I used to astonish the country people, and there was not a barmaid along the road within forty miles of London who had not made love to me after her fashion. But then I had metal more attractive in London. Well, I was going what I call the Midland Circuit, in this very same gig, driving this very same mare. 
It was just after Thurtell cut Weir's throat, in a melancholy time it was, the country papers were full of murders, and every passenger on the road looked sharply into the faces of those whom he met, and thought every other person a highwayman. As for me, I put a couple of good double-barrel pistols close to me in the gig, buttoned my coat round me, and determined to take my chance. I was in the tobacco trade then as now. Perhaps so many people didn't smoke as now, perhaps they did. At any rate, cigars and tobacco were higher in price, and we made such a good thing of it that no one could afford to keep a traveller from taking orders, especially just about Christmas time, when I was closing up the orders for the old year and getting fresh in for the new. Well, I was down in Oxfordshire, travelling northward, and I got to Oxford a few days before Christmas. When I got there, I found a letter from the governors stating that about twenty miles north a bill would be due, and we'd be paid at the bank there upon the day after Christmas Day. I knew they were in want of money, and I quite understood that my orders were imperative that I should be ready to present the bill when due. I wanted to get home amazingly, but what was to be done? The bill must be presented, and so there was an end of it. Sure enough, I stayed in Oxford to eat my Christmas dinner. I went to church and heard the cathedral service in the morning and joined in the Christmas hymn. I looked hard at the melancholy old fellows, the few, very few, who were left in the colleges upon that day. I thought how lonely must their life be, and before I went to dinner I walked into two or three of the colleges and marked one or two solitary lights in the windows of some of the quadrangles and thought, almost with tears in my eyes, of the poor solitary scholars, the reading men, who were there alone with their books upon Christmas Day. I made myself thoroughly miserable about them, I can tell you. They might have rare puddings in the hall and fine beef, I dare say, but the poor sizer or servitor... One's Oxford and the other Cambridge, I don't know which, they're the same thing in spirit, sat there by his twinkling candle, thinking, I'll be bound, of Christmas Day at home. I was so melancholy and depressed with these thoughts that it came into my head that the best thing I could do was to drive them away, or else I knew that I should spoil my dinner. I therefore whistled the end of a tune. It was Begone Dull Care, then fashionable, I think, and began my journey toward the White Heart. Mine was not to be a solitary dinner. Groggins, an enterprising young fellow in the wine trade, he has chalk stones on his fingers, a large fortune, and occasional fits of delirium tremens now, was to be my companion, and after dinner the landlord was to come up and to bear his part in a song and in a bowl of punch, which, in honour of its being Christmas, he had, time out of mind, provided for us bagmen. Well, I was just stepping out of the quad at Corpus, turning round my head to look at a solitary twinkling light of one poor devil in the corner, when who should I run against but a collegian? He was a tall, thin, melancholy man with a torn gown, a very seedy square cap, things which then, as now, were honourable, and from the state of these things I knew him to be learned. He was making towards the light I was looking at when I ran bump against him, he didn't hurt me, I was a stout fellow then, but I must have given him an awkward knock, for I sent him flying yards away. He was as polite as Chesterfield, for he capped to me at once and bowed and asked my pardon for his awkwardness. That told me that he was a poor student, a sizar. If he had been a gentleman commoner or nobleman, he would have sworn at me like a bagman. "'Your awkwardness, sir,' cried I. Upon my word, it was mine, and mine alone, and to apologize more substantially for it, may I be so bold as to wish you a Merry Christmas. I said this in my jolliest voice, and took off my hat as I said it. The collegian gave a sigh as he answered, A Merry Christmas. I wish one to you, sir. That sigh troubled me so much that my mind was made up what to do at once. I quite pitied the student, and, putting out my hand, took his, a long, thin, cold, consumptive hand it was, and shook it. "'Come, sir,' said I, "'do me the favour, if you have no better invitation, to come and dine with me at the White Hart. I'm no scholar myself, and hope I don't offend you. I mean it in good will. A bottle of old port, a cut from the breast of a turkey, and a piece of beef will do neither of us harm, I'll wager. Here I fell to whistling the roast beef of old England for want of filling up the pause in a better way. 
The student smiled in a faint, shadowy way at my manner, and without a pause accepted the invitation. When I had got him, I felt somehow awkward, and I didn't know what to do with him. He was a gentleman and a scholar, accepting the invitation of a bagman. How should I make him jolly? Would my rude mirth and town stories please him? Would he care to know the maker's price of the weed? I was so fat and burly, he so long, thin, and shadowy, I so untaught, he so learned. I knew this by his air, his manner, his walk. I felt at the same time awkward and proud, frightened and rejoiced at my guest's presence. Presently, the sound of Christmas bells came upon the air, so jubilant, ringing, thronging, hurrying through the air, tumbling over each other in their hurry to get through the belfry bars, and carrying so much good fellowship with them that I felt quite ashamed of my pride. Eighteen hundred and twenty years ago, thought I, there was no pride about the invitation given then. It's the holy season, and the best way to keep it holy is to behave naturally and kindly, and to put my pride in my pocket. After all, I'm not sure that the student will not be very glad to dine with me. These thoughts flashed through my brain in a minute. I had scarcely gathered up my thoughts when, through the ringing of the bells, I heard the voice of my acquaintance propose that he should run to his rooms and change his dress, but I, looking at my watch, and not sorry at walking with a gown, took his arm within mine, and declaring that not a moment was to be lost, set out for the white heart. The landlord looked surprised at me and my guest. What was more, the boots, who, with a shining face and hair combed straight upon his forehead, stood at the door, partly in expectation of a Christmas box and partly to greet his old friends, absolutely did not recognize the student. Now, I should tell you that Boots was an old Boots, and that his particular pride and fame lay in the fact that he positively could remember the faces of every one of the members of the colleges, and that upon consulting him upon any point in that way, he was never found to trip. Well, we went up into the great room of the inn. The landlord had drawn the screen round the table, enclosing the fire, and endeavored to take away from the vastness of the room. There was a four-branch candlestick with wax candles, but they didn't seem to me to give much light. The very fire on the hearth, which was roaring up the huge chimney when we came in, I fancied to smolder down all of a sudden, and the wax candles actually to want snuffing. A letter with a great vulgar commercial seal lay upon the table. It was from my intended companion, Tom Groggins, who wrote to say that he had been invited to a Christmas dinner at a tradesman's upon whom he had called for orders, and finished by a... P.S. Two of the daughters sing like angels. I wished the daughters had been anywhere else. I depended upon Tom Groggins' cheerful voice and air, I absolutely felt my spirit sinking. I'm very sorry, sir, said I to the student. But positively, I shall have to do all the honors myself. My friend has disappointed me, and I've got no vice. No what? queried the student. No, no vice, no gentleman to support me. Oh, that's all, cried he, gaily. I didn't quite take you at first. Oh, never mind. I'll be your vice. I'll support you. Here he took off his cap, disclosing a beautifully high, pale forehead, down the very center of which the short, curly, crisp hair grew in a peak, allowing me to notice temples which were as white and polished as the cicatrice of a burn, just as if, indeed, as if two horns had been cut off and the wounds cauterized. He sat down with great alacrity, and the first course, a boiled turkey, having been placed on the table, I sat down too, and proposed to say grace, which I never omit upon Christmas Day. Ah, uh, stop, cried the student. I belong to the clerical profession. I'm a, I'm a clerk, though not in orders. I'll say grace. Do you say it in English? Of course I do, I returned. Ah, he exclaimed, I say it in Latin, an old form, you know. Say on, then, I answered, no matter what the form be, I can think, though I'm no scholar. Good, 
returned the student, bending down his head so that the white temples glistened in the light. He then uttered very heartily a few words which he said were the grace, but which I thought, strangely enough, sounded like an imprecation. We fell to, but not with that hearty good will which one should when at a Christmas dinner. There's something particularly Christian-like and jolly in eating, at least so I think. Men eat variously, to be sure. Some spread about their victuals over their plates and then glower over them and then devour them. Some men eat ravenously, like wolves. Others daintily, like pretty ladies. Some men nibble, others gobble and bolt. My friend did not do either. The victuals seemed to glide and slide from the edge of his plate to his knife and fork and thence to his mouth with an ease and agility which astonished and confounded me. I never saw any other man eat as he did. I've had pretty good practice in my life, but my student friend beat both me and all my acquaintances, living or dead. The aldermen in chains, as they then used to denominate the turkey and sausages, had very nearly disappeared. I should have sent it away with only a modest slice cut out of its breast, but the student would not agree to that and sliced and cut it nearly to a skeleton. I never saw either a better carver. Wings and legs, breast back and side bones came away like magic. The student did everything with a grace, and even the landlord, who fell back aghast when he came in with the second course, an immense piece to resistance in the shape of a sirloin of beef, although he looked with a profoundly sad and regretful eye at the remains of the turkey, treated the student with marked respect, and placed the beef before him. Landlord, said he, what have you to drink? Something I hope that will give me a better appetite. We've been playing at present. Some hawk or some sparkling moselle, returned our host. Pish, said the other. Give me something fresh and new. We understand all of these things. Let our friend drink light wines and bring me some gin and bitters. Mind, the best of both, and just give the fire a poke. Its spirits are gone out. I was aghast. Here was one on whom I had previously looked with respect, asking for the most vulgar of vulgar liquids. The landlord merely bowed his assent, and, as it was Christmas Day, I bade my guest drink what he chose to call for. He took me at my word, repeated his order to the landlord, and tossed off the bumper of gin and bitters in a way which made me fancy that the liquid hissed as it rolled over his hot tongue. Ah... Uh thought I. It's a wild life they lead at college. This young man will be a ruined man. I cannot say that the liquid appeared to affect him at all. He said it was water and threw a portion of it in the fire, which blazed up in a pale blue flame, testifying to the goodness of our host's spirit, and at the same time lighting up the pale countenance of my guest and making me mark more than ever the deep lines in his face extending from his nose to his chin and those which spread out from the corners of his eyes like the lines in a map which show you which way a certain route runs. The beef went pretty nearly as quickly as the turkey had gone. I call my memory to witness that it was not eaten by me. I cannot remember that even without dread, nor the face of the landlord bathed almost in tears as he carried away just a slight shade of the sirloin. The excellent man bore in a pudding with despair, but the landlord's daughter, who had an artistic eye, had marked a cross in honor of the day in red berries upon one side of it. It was a huge pudding, and looked nobly with the leaves crackling and glistening in the light above it. The pudding was carried to me. I preserved the pretty cross, not only in obedience to my own tastes, but also to that of my companion, who, when he saw it, would not touch the pudding. He took a mince pie and talked some nonsense about the holly bears poisoning the pudding, but I didn't heed him. I was only glad we should redeem our character a little. I'll be bound that down in the kitchen they had called a council to consider our enormous appetites. The pudding, with its red cross of beads, was therefore sent away untouched except by me. The cloth removed, we turned to the fire, and the stranger, remarking that he ought to know something about fires, since he lit his own and that never went out, gave ours a poke which made it brilliant in a minute. 
The landlord then brought in a bowl of punch, emptied a glass of it in wishing us a Merry Christmas, and then hurried out of the room to his Christmas dinner. Poor man, my heart misgave me when he left. I thought how his wife pitched into him about his guests. But if my heart misgave about the landlord, I confess it did much more so about myself. What was I to do with my strange guest? Here was he, glowering over the punch bowl, drinking like a madman, and yet without the slightest effect being produced upon him. I took two or three glasses of punch just to give myself Dutch courage, and then boldly faced my guest and asked him to give me his song. This he did not seem inclined to do, but he said he would tell me a story, and of all the miserable, wretched abominations perpetuated at Christmas time, his was the worst. I declare it gives me even now the horrors to think of it. There was a German legend about love and ending in suicide. The love was none of your true-hearted, legitimate English love, but puny, miserable love. A love which will not fix upon a maiden object, but perversely chooses a married woman, and then, with a heart stuffed full of immorality, a brain of sophisms, and a mouth full of lies, drives the hero, a pretty hero indeed, to poison his mistress, and then to cut his own throat. I declare I felt my gall rising. I cleared my throat to speak, and trounced my guest soundly. He laughed hollowly enough and talked about the English being excessively tame and silly and wondered why we didn't show the same spirit as our neighbors did. Heaven preserve me from such Christmas talk. I had made up my mind to give him a piece of it when he opened his mouth again and proposed Snapdragon. The punch was gone, and while I played at Snapdragon, he said he would brew some punch. I was terribly weary. I wished heartily that he would go to Quad, as he called his dreary chamber in the old college, but I could not drive away my guest. He lighted the snapdragon, therefore, and he tucked up his coat cuffs, I declare he wore no shirt, and showed his long, thin, bony hands at work in the brewing. He next, to give more effect to the snapdragon, blew out the candles. How deadly pale he looked by the dancing fires of the spirits! How hollowly he laughed when I, unable to keep my eyes from him, burned my fingers in trying to grope for some raisins. Why should we two grown-up people play at such a game? Why should the flame gradually creep up my sleeves, envelop my arms, and dance about my body? Why should his shining temples glitter like silver in a cold moonlight and all of a sudden sprout with little horns of flame? Horns of flame on his temples, tufts and sprouts of flame all over his body, crawling in a quick yet stealthy manner, lighting up his ghastly cheeks, his perfectly handsome and marble face, blue on his temples, blue from his eyes, and blue from his ears, but sulfur color tending to a rosy flame breaking from his mouth. I was determined to stop it. I shouted, Save yourself! Stop it! Fire! Fire! Loudly as I tried to cry, I did not hear my own voice, but I rolled myself on the hearth rug in an agony of fear and put out my own flames. When I arose, I still tried to cry. I know what it is, I gasped. It's... I see it all. It's spontaneous combustion. It is no such thing, Mr. Boodle, said the strange student quietly. Tis a little natural magic, that's all. Oh, that's all? Is it, huh? I gasped, my voice again coming to my aid. Give me some punch. Uh, do anything to... to... To take away the fright, my dear Boodle. How absurd of you, to be sure. Here. Here is some punch of my own brewing. I drank it rapidly. I believed then, and I believe to this day, that it was a glass of fire, hot, of course, and yet sweet, exhilarating, delicious. It ran tingling through my chest, round about my heart, through my shoulders, under my arms, making my elbows feel funny, and my very fingers as if they didn't belong to me. Running downward, it made my knees knock together with a delicious delirium tremens, darted into the soles of my boots, warming the calves of my legs in its backward transit, and then shooting up my spine till it settled itself in the back of my cranium and drove me mad. That 
was the effect of that punch. I was mad, raving mad. The place itself whirled around with me and seemed motive and alive. The student sat opposite with his elbows on the table, his ghastly face exaggerated in its horrible whiteness. In his long, claw-like hands, he gazed upon me with a face full of malice. I still drank on. Drink? I couldn't help drinking. The very glasses were alive. Some of them had legs and staggered towards me with a drunken gravity and bowed with a mock, splay-footed humility, begging me to empty them. Others, not content with this, flew around my head like the brass balls of a street conjurer, whilst I, catching them with a wondrous dexterity, emptied each in its turn. Meantime, a little dog, which was basking on the mat before us, lost form, became serpentine, and burst out into a strange compound of fiendish hands, fowl-like legs, and lizard tail, which, headless and monstrous, held up in his hands a tall glass of punch and begged me to drink. Suddenly, the clocks of the various churches struck twelve, and I was sobered in an instant. The dog, I am bound to say, became a dog again, and the glasses, but they were empty, stayed quietly on the table, and did not offer themselves to my grasp. I rocked to and fro in my chair. I didn't know what to do or think. My head still ached, ready to split. The bill is due tomorrow, said the student, whose face did not look so very fiendish. If you go on drinking like that, Mr. Boodle, you will never be able to present it. My college punch was good, was it not? Good, cried I bitterly. Good. Oh, yes. And then, with a desperate resolution, I cried, I'll go now. I'll go at once. I said this because I knew it was the only way to get rid of my tormentor. I'll go with you, he answered. You will find someone up when we get there who will give us a bed. Come along, another glass, and ring the bell. I rang the bell. The sleepy ostler declared gruffly that it was rum go to have a hoss put to at that time of night, Christmas night, too, but the Boots, who was not sorry to get rid of us, offered to help him, and thus the matter was concluded. When I got into the gig, I wrapped myself up warmly. My tormentor mounted beside me. He said he went to take care of me. Take care of me, indeed. We drove out into the quaint streets of the old city, with its colleges with spires and gothic archways, the old gable ends of houses showing sharp and clear in the moonlight. No one was abroad. We drove, as it were, through a city of the dead. The moon was on the off side of us a little to our back, so that it threw the shadow of the horse and gig and the driver plainly enough before us on the near side. I say the driver only, for the thing which sat beside me in a ragged college gown and square cap had no shadow. I was not surprised. I had been horrified to my utmost. I could wonder no more. I drove forward into the open country, where the road glistened with white in the moonlight, and the long shadows of the trees were thrown across our path. Out and away, far away, the mare traveled like lightning. I had a strong arm, but it ached with my attempt to hold her in. The road soon changed. It was no longer an English country road, but a plain, straight viaduct with water on each side of it. Multitudes of people were passing, and some strange vehicles drawn by long-tailed Flemish horses with plumes of feathers on their heads. The drivers were the thinnest men I ever saw, mere lanterns of men with positively nothing in them. I struck one of them with my whip, and he sounded like a dried bladder. You might as well have whipped an empty cape. My strange friend bade me not to whip those drivers, for they would one day drive me, and that men often thought them their friends. I shuddered as he said it. I saw the strange, silent eagerness of the passers-by, the thousands thronging to the same goal, the ceaseless hurry of the feet, the careless look of all who trod the way, and I thought to myself that I knew what that way was. 
My companion was himself changed. He was no longer gloomy, but genial. He told me not to be in any hurry, for, said he, we were sure to get to the end of the journey at the appointed time. No one was ever known to be behind hand, however slowly he traveled, and as for those who hurried, they were only laughed at for their pains when they arrived. Under these circumstances, therefore, I again tried to pull in my mare upon whom the pace was beginning to tell. As we went forwards on that straight road, I saw that poor mare grew old and out of condition. My spick and span new harness was cracked and appeared to be mended with ropes. The very vehicle on which we sat, instead of being of the newest fashion, seemed worn and pelted, rotten and worm-eaten. I wondered how it could hold together. Some of the people whom I saw walking along the road soon grew tired of the monotony of the scene. Others declared that there were no places to stay at, and indeed they were pretty well driven mad by fellows with whips who kept urging them forward whether they would or not. But there were some, although I confess not the majority, who were delighted with the road, and to whom it certainly did offer pleasures and advantages, for they, passing over the streams on each side of the pathway, strolled into pleasant meadows, where they lay down and disported themselves, free from evil or anxiety. The common passengers on the road fixed their eyes on these gay fellows, and praised their happiness, and contrasted their lot with their own, but I observed that, although they grew morose and sad at their hard condition, and the contrast thus afforded them, they seldom took occasion to observe how many were, like themselves, toiling on a painful, weary, hard road, with very indifferent clothing against the weather, and with few or no shoes to speak of. Some were so pricked and urged by the contrast that they, taking the advice of certain evil companions marvelously like my student, who trudged by their side, threw themselves at once into the river with a despairing yell. I found afterwards, however, that this haste did them no possible good, for my companion told me with a malicious grin that the river ran a great deal faster than the road, and that when we got to the great terminus we should find that these desperate people had arrived before us, sadly wetted, tumbled, and bruised, and heartily ashamed of their precipitancy and haste. There were also, but they were so few that I need scarcely mention them, Others, who went quietly along, picking out the clean and smooth places in the road, taking no heed of much gold and silver which was strewn about, but always in foul and muddy spots, would bind up their feet as well as they could, shielding themselves and their neighbors from all harm, and who, having paced along pleasantly, we found had arrived quite freshly and blithely at their journey's end. I observed that a great many people who stooped down to the muddy holes and loaded their pockets, heads, breasts, and backs with gold and silver generally called these people fools, asses, and idiots, and despised them heartily, and would puff along under their burden, bragging how hard it was to acquire the gold and riches that they had about them, but which I am certain were very easily picked up. Indeed, the only condition for picking them up was that whoever did so must not fear the dirt." For although many began the employment with clean hands, yet I found that when they had been some time engaged in the pursuit, they grew marvelously dirty. Poor fellows, they were to be pitied, for when we arrived near the end of our journey, I found that all of them had to throw down their burden, aye, and to wash themselves pretty clean too before they were allowed to enter, so that none of these, I should fancy, who took to the occupation, which was so very popular, of gold-picking, got the first place. As for myself, I never quite reached it, but it could not, I think, have been very far off, when my strange friend gave the reins a pull and turned the decrepit old mare into a wayside inn. Such an inn. It had been a magnificent church once, but now it served for meaner purposes. The oriel window had been blocked up, galleries built along the aisles, and the arches were filled with bricks. It was miserable to look at, very miserable. I shivered as I entered it. The student jumped out of the gig and called for the ostler. A miserable, wan skeleton of a man came out and took the old mare's head. I got down and felt terribly stiff and old. I opened the well of the gig where my samples and my valuables and my bill were and took them out. 
I had a great mind to run away, but I didn't know my road, and, wanting to go to sleep and to rid me of my companion, I called for the chambermaid. She came. Such a woman I never saw before, and never want to see again. She was a dried mummy of a creature, with the same discolored face, dusty eyes, and parchment mouth which a mummy has. She tried to look pleasant, I dare say, but had only that mummy look of drawing her blue lips over her teeth, ready to split them, which all mummies have. I snatched the candle from her and asked her which bedroom I should have, but I received no answer and rushed forward. The first room I found was a double-bedded room, but, not caring to search further, I took it. It was a sad, moldy old place with cobweb curtains and hangings and enough to give one the rheumatism to look at. Anxious about my bell and knowing that we had but few hours to sleep, I undid my dressing case to see that everything was all safe. In unpacking this, I happened to uncover the looking glass in the pocket of the cover, and looking therein, found that I myself was withered down to an old, old man, and that my clothes hung bagging and worn to shreds upon me. I was proceeding with my search when a hand was laid upon my shoulder and the case was snatched away. With rage and fury, I, knowing it must be the student, for a horrid prescience told me who it was, sprang upon him and shouted, Thieves! Robbers! Plunderers! With all my might. My voice was not gone, that was certain. Hush, hush, said a cheerful voice, which was that of Tom Groggins. Hush, you're all right now. Isn't he, doctor? Quite right. Look at his eyes. He isn't the same man. The doctor peered into my face and looked quite delighted. Oh, Boodle, Boodle, how you frightened me, said poor Tom with a choked voice. We gave you up ever so many times, that we did. Gave me up, eh? Where's the bill? Where's the student? Where the... Now be quiet, Mr. Boodle, said the doctor. Be quiet, it's all right. The bill is paid a month ago. The truth is, you and your college friend, whom you frightened preciously, ate too much of the turkey, beef, and pudding on Christmas Day. You've had an attack of apoplexy and then a brain fever, and now you are well over it. That was the account they gave of it, said Mr. Boodle, looking solemnly around. But I ignore it. I don't believe it. I believe I was ill, very ill, and enough to make me. But I will swear to every bit of the story, to the student and the inn and the road to it, especially the dirty people picking up heaps of gold. Heaps of gold. We have to love Boodle, don't we? So robust and cheerful and good-natured, kind of awkwardly trying to be a good host to this increasingly infernal guest. This is a funny story. It has dark moments for sure, and I suppose a, a kind of a moral, but it also has some lightness and some playfulness. His devil is sinister and evil, but doesn't actually do anything to him besides give him some punch and some crazy visions. I love the scene where everything is burning with a blue flame and the cups are dancing around him begging to be drunk. It's actually, it's a bit like that horrible scene in Dumbo, isn't it? I want to come back to a couple throwaway sentences at the very beginning of this story, where the author says he always makes a point of asking the wrong man to do the right thing, to better show off the abilities of those who are skilled. What an incredible party strategy. If you had friends who are good-natured, that could be a really wonderful way of helping everyone have a good time, like the people who are intentionally bad at karaoke. Of course, I'm ascribing good nature to our author, which is not necessarily explicit in the text. He could just be a jerk who wants to make people look bad. We've had James Friswell on the channel before with The Dead Man's Story, another weird encounter with the devil. So let's take a moment to look at the game of Snapdragons, since this story got me so interested in it. Snapdragons, or flap dragons, were first mentioned in writing in the works of Shakespeare in the 16th century. 
It is essentially a raisin, usually a raisin, although it could be other dried fruits or nuts or whatever, that are soaked in liquor, usually brandy, but it could be another type, and then lit on fire, and you eat them whilst they are on fire. By the 1800s, it had become a game, a parlor game. In the UK, it was a Christmas game. Apparently in the US, it was played at Halloween. To play Snapdragon, you take a large, shallow bowl, you fill it with brandy and raisins, and you light the brandy on fire. You turn off all the other lights to enhance the effect of the brandy fire, and then everyone snatches raisins and eats them while they burn. According to Wikipedia, there is an article written in 1710, and it says, quote, The wantonness of the thing was to see each other look like a demon as we burnt ourselves and snatched out the fruit, end quote. Now, of course, you had to place the bowl of fire on a low table to minimize damage from splashing fiery brandy everywhere. There's an 1879 book of days that says the game is accompanied by this rhyme, here he comes with flaming bowl, don't he mean to take his toll, snip, snap, dragon. Take care you don't take too much, be not greedy in your clutch, snip, snap, dragon. With his blue and lapping tongue, many of you will be stung, snip, snap, dragon. For he snaps at all that comes, snatching at his feast of plums, snip, snap, dragon. But old Christmas makes him come, though he looks so fee fa foam, snip snap dragon. Don't you fear him, but be bold. Out he goes, his flames are cold, snip snap dragon. According to some traditions, a person could snatch the most raisins or a particular lucky raisin, and they could get like good fortune or a wish or true love or something in the coming year. There's also an 1852 Christmas tradition variant where you place a candle in a cup of ale or cider and you try to drink the drink without burning your face. <laughs> Which, to be honest, sounds much more fun than bobbing for apples. If you listen all the way to the end of the video, you get to hear me make a little confession. This week's confession is that this game of Snapdragon reminds me of a game that my mom and I used to play with a family friend and her daughter, who was about my age. We called it the candle game. In this game, a taper candle is burning in the middle of the table, and each of the four players also has a burning taper candle in their hand, standing around the table. The objective of the game is to be the only person with a lit candle. You need to blow out other people's while protecting your own. If your candle goes out, you can relight it from the candle in the middle of the table, but of course it's very vulnerable when it's just out in the middle of the table like that. I cannot describe how fun this game is. You're holding your candle behind you. You're huffing and puffing at everything else. Everyone is huffing and puffing at you. It's impossible to be vigilant in all directions at all times. It was probably actually pretty hazardous in retrospect, but way less hazardous than Snapdragon, and people played that game for centuries. Oh, in old wooden houses with wooden furniture, wearing big wigs and feathers and whatnot on their heads and layers of petticoats and lace cuffs and whatever on their bodies, and no smoke detectors or fire extinguishers. So, I'm just saying, that if everyone is old enough and the room is large enough, and you don't have curtains or sofas or anything up against the table, maybe give the candle game a try this holiday season. If you like dangerous pastimes like playing with fire or dining with the devil, you should subscribe to this channel. Every week I find a weird old story and I share it with you, and this is the perfect time of year for cuddling up with a weird tale. Please also like this story or drop me a comment below. It helps other people find the channel. And maybe consider using the link in the description to buy me a coffee. Thank you so much for your support, and I will see you in a few days.